This is Monday. So every Monday we come together. We will be talking about hypovolemic shock today. And I'm going to do my um, eight to 10 minute lecture. We're going to get into some NCLEX questions and then I have your motivation. So this is it right now. Shout out to everybody watching on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, no matter where you are. We getting it rolling today. Okay, so we are talking about we are talking about hypovolemic shock. And get out your notebooks because this isn't something that I may have gone over specifically yet. And so this may be new information to you guys. But anyways, hypovolemic shock is very easy because you see the prefix hypo, and that is going to mean low. So what are we talking about? When we talk about a hypovolemic situation, well, listen, all it is is you have either a low blood volume or you have a low body fluid volume, right? That is what the hypo indicates. And so when we talk about where we start to see symptoms, when the patient becomes symptomatic, that is anything that is more than 15% of the body's fluid. So because we're mostly made of water, we tend to suffer really quickly if that fluid loss is present. And so things that we can expect our patient to have from hypovolemic shock would be um, impaired functions of body organs or, or even, you know, uh, or even worsening symptoms than what they presently may be dealing with. So for example, if your patient has, um, if they have a burn or if they are having uh, diarrhea, then those things will be worse as the condition progresses. And then also organ failure as a result of a low perfusion, right? Uh, whether that's blood perfusion or um, fluid and nutrient perfusion. And so this is a life-threatening emergency medical condition, which means you, you better know it for your NCLEX exam. All right, or your exit exams if you are in nursing school. So let's get into some causes where what would cause our patient to have a blood loss. And so there are some things um, internally and externally that can happen. So, for example, uh, a serious wound or a cut is going to create a lot of blood loss, a traumatic injury, again, um, would, would do that, whether you fell off of a ladder or you were shot, right? Um, vaginal bleeding can be excessive in the form of hemorrhaging. Sometimes uh, fibroids can um, cause excessive amounts of vaginal bleeding. Blood in the urine, um, that may be uh, more specifically related if you have a, a trauma and your um your bladder maybe ha has been compromised or, or something in that where you're having excessive amounts of blood in the urine and or internal bleeding. Internal bleeding will cause a, a, a blood shift, right? Fluid loss can also be precipitated by, I mentioned it earlier, burns, a high fever, excessive diarrhea, vomiting, or sweating. And so these things will cause fluid shifts in the body where you have um, issues of a compromise happening. Because we know that when we talk about Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs, water is going to be right there at the foundation, like water over pain, water over um, psychosocial issues, right? So diarrhea, um, excessive sweating, these things are going to be high on a patient priority list. Even if, even if you don't think like, oh, you know, diarrhea, you know, or my patient says they're thirsty, they're dehydrated for your NCLEX exam, that's high alert. That's priority. Okay. So what are we talking about in terms of symptoms. What are we talking about in terms of symptoms? And I want you to definitely tag your favorite nursing student, the one you sit in class with and say, girl, we talked about this. Look, Regina's going over it today. So our symptoms of hypovolemic shock are going to be 
and, and think about the manifestation of it and what is going to be affected by these symptoms. So if my patient is having a low blood pressure, what organs are going to be affected by this low blood pressure? As we prepare for next generation NCLEX and we're thinking about our, um, our, 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 our action model, right? If my patient comes in with low blood pressure, what organs are going to be affected? What laboratory values do I need to look at? All right. I'm, I'm expecting my heart to be affected. My kidneys are going to be affected, right? My lungs are going to be affected. The patient's also going to have a low temperature. Yes, I see the comments. Good job. So low temperature. What types of interventions what I need to be doing for a low temperature. We never think about that. We always think about high temperature, right? But a low temperature, what type of interventions will I need to have in place? Patients having a fast heart rate. What is going to be the solution for a patient with hypovolemic shock if they have a fast heart rate? Think about it. What is going to be our solution for this? Okay, and I, I'm definitely going to go over the, the management, but before I tell you the answers, I want you to think about it. I want you to know about it. All right, um, fast breathing, but the breathing is shallow. Fast, but the breathing is shallow. Yes, I see the answers on the screen. You guys are doing great. And this is how you should be studying content. This is exactly how you should be studying content. Okay. Weak pulses. My patient's going to have weak pulses. Well, that makes sense. Why would they be having weak pulses? Okay. Because that blood volume is low. So the arteries don't have much to push against. Cyanosis. What does that tell you about an intervention you need to do for your patient? Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cold and clammy skin. That is the hallmark of shock, right? Hypovolemic shock. Also, you're going to see this in, in what other kind of condition? We're also going to see this in, in diabetes mellitus type 2, right? When the blood sugar is what? When the blood sugar is high or low. When do you get cold and clammy skin in diabetes mellitus type 2? And you see how when you study content, I can pull you guys in and out of different topics because our bodies are going to respond similarly to many different conditions, right? So we're talking about hypovolemic shock, which is a low blood volume, but also we can relate that to diabetes mellitus when there is a low blood sugar, okay? Low blood sugar, you get that cold and clammy presentation from your patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Yeah, 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 that's how it works. And so we say cold and clammy needs some what? If your patient has diabetes mellitus and they're in shock because their blood sugar is low, what do we need to give them? We say cold and clammy needs some candy. But here we're not going to give candy because our issue is something different. Okay, um, little to no urine output. Well, that makes sense. Weakness, that also makes sense because you are not girded up with strength, right? Um, confusion, because our brain is affected from a low blood pressure, lightheadedness, and a loss of consciousness. All right, so these are all the symptoms. But what is most important, nursing students, is not that you just know the symptoms, but you can identify complications related to the symptoms and you can foresee um, physician orders in regards to it. So again, some of the complications, if we let these symptoms continue on, we are going to have a dehydration issue. We're going to have a, a damage to the body organs the patient will have some myocardial infarction going on, inadequate oxygen to the tissues, hypoxia. And then, um, of course, that will, all those things will precede death if it is left untreated. So quickly, what is the treatment? Our priority management when it comes to um, hypovolemic shock, it is, uh, it is an issue with oxygenation. Okay. We, we have to make sure that our patient is 
properly oxygenated during this time. Treatment is going to be to redistribute the body fluids. We, we, we definitely have to do that, right? So we're going to be redistributing the body fluids. We are going to be specifically looking out for the vital organs. The position that you need to know is going to be Trendelenburg's or, or um, modified Trendelenburg's, okay? The medications that you give for this, all right? And, and I'm doing it in, this is just my general outline, okay? Definitely IV fluids. We're definitely going to give IV fluids, and I'm going to get to that. Um, but there are other things that you can do as well, okay? So oxygen, positioning, medications, and the medications that you're going to give are the inotropes, all right? And these are going to help to restore the volume. These are going to help the body to hold on to water. The inotropes are going to help the heart pump blood, right, more. Um, the, the, the vasopressors, they're going to help the patient to retain water. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, they help your body handle shock. Okay, they help your body handle periods of stress. And so we're going to give these. All right. Um, if it is a situation where there is blood loss and that is the issue, all right, we're going to stop the blood loss. That is going to be the priority. And it's like, oh, yes, yeah, so we could just give IV fluids. But we have to make sure that we are addressing things in context. Okay. Okay particularly for NCLEX. So if the, um, if the patient is having a shock because of a situation like um, maybe they're in shock because of an ectopic pregnancy, right? We need to end the pregnancy. There needs to be surgery to happen immediately. That's the only treatment. If the patient is in shock because they um, have severed a limb, we need to address the bleeding out of that limb. We need to stop the, the bleeding or the blood loss or the fluid loss, okay? And so that's where medications can help work, work rapidly for this situation. And then, of course, if we are um, replacing blood loss or fluid loss, we have the blood transfusions, which could be the solution for our patient or IV fluids, all right? And so it's all very contextual. And so that's why you have to be a generalist. You have to be a generalist when taking NCLEX. NCLEX is not about specialties. It's not about, um, and, and that's why nurses who work in a field for a long time have issues teaching to the NCLEX, right? Um, and and um, you, you have to be able to look at the context of a situation and pull out what's important for NCLEX based on that scenario, not what you do in the hospitals, okay? Not what you do in the hospitals. All right, um, so our nursing management, what else are we concerned about? What else are our priority issues? Close monitoring of the vital signs and the mental status of the patient, oxygenation and perfusion, as well as urinary output. And because this situation is so dependent on fluid volume return, you should at least have two um, intravenous lines for the purpose of delivering rapid blood products or fluids, as well as medications, all right? Because, you know, some, some if you're giving a patient blood, you don't want to put medications through that same port, or if you're giving certain medications, you don't want to mix them with other medications. So having two IV accesses is, is also going to be important for your NCLEX exam, all right? Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. All right, again, something else to be mindful of, guys, when you're taking NCLEX, we always want to keep this patient warm. We always want to keep this patient warm because one of the issues that you have with hypovolemia is you also have hypothermia. And so when you are preparing for your safety board exam, get this 
in your mind is something that you're going to have to watch out for. It's a potential complication. Um, and it is something that you should be proactive about, proactive about. And again, because we are trying to reverse a condition very quickly, our patient is at risk. We're talking about hypovolemic shock. Our patient is at risk for fluid overload. Clients receiving transfusion of blood products, uh, intravenous fluids, right? Um, maybe albumin, maybe plasma, you know, they may experience fluid overload and or allergic reactions, allergic reactions. Okay, so we did the content. You guys stay with me the whole time, participated. Now, let's see how you do with these NCLEX questions. Here's the first one. It is this. A registered nurse understands that hypovolemic shock happens when a person loses more than blank of the body's blood and volume fluid. Is it number one, 40%? Number two, 15%? Number three, 50%? Or number four, 25%? Ah, were you on time for class today? If you were on time for class today, well, then you will get this one effortlessly. You come here, you show up, you receive information, and then you demonstrate that you got it. I love it. I see the answers on the screen. It's looking good, guys. It's looking good. The correct answer is indeed number two, 15%. Hypovolemic shock happens when a person loses more than 15% of their body's blood or fluids. Moving on. All right, see if your friend that you tag knows the answer to this question. A client is brought to the ED due to heavy bleeding at three days postpartum. The client is experiencing hypovolemic shock as evidenced by weakness, paler, and extreme confusion. What would be the nurse's immediate action? Number one, keep the client warm. Two, Reorient the confused client. Three, start an IV line with normal saline. Or four, prepare for a possible endotracheal intubation. Mm. I got nothing more to say, but you better get this one right. I want to see the answer. Shout out to Arlene. I see some people that are Remar representatives. They show up to class every Monday. Um, and when I was doing my live classes, you guys say, Regina, we're there every Monday waiting for you. The correct answer, guys, you may have struggled with this one a bit. I see some people have, but the correct answer was indeed number three. Start an IV line with normal saline. Good, good job if you got this right. For clients who are already experiencing shock, it is essential to control further blood or fluid loss and stabilize circulating blood volume. Um, so this prevents further complications. So the one that was most needful for the client was indeed number three. Moving on, question number three is this. Organ failure. Organ failure is one of the serious complications of hypovolemic shock. This directly results from the body's problem with number one, waste and toxic excretion, two, thermal regulation, three, tissue perfusion or four clotting factors. Hey, we are talking hypovolemic shock. And this is asking you to examine why is organ failure an end result of untreated hypovolemic shock? What would be a cause of it? What would be a root cause of it? The correct answer is pow. Did you get it right? Tissue perfusion. Yes. A significant de decrease in blood volume that occurs in hypovolemic shock causes poor blood and oxygen supply throughout the entire body. And so when poor circulation in inadequate tissue perfusion is left unmanaged, organ failure will occur. That's it. 
that's it. Uh, I got another question for you. Question number four. This may be our final question. This may be our final question. Um, unless you guys hit the challenge. Okay. So number four, the nurse cares for a pediatric client with moderate dehydration due to gastroenteritis. Strict monitoring is done to prevent hypovolemic shock. Which of the following findings would alert the nurse? Okay, let me read it again. The nurse cares for a pediatric client with moderate dehydration due to gastroenteritis. Strict monitoring is done to prevent hypovolemic shock. Which of the following findings would alert the nurse? Okay. And we're saying which of the following findings would alert the nurse that the patient is experiencing hypovolemic shock? What do you guys think? Okay. So it's number one, loss of appetite. Two, dark brown urine. Three, no urine output. Or four, temperature at 38 degrees Celsius. What do you guys say? Mm, I see some, ah, I guess everybody is saying number three. Is there anybody that wants to put anything different? I got a four, I got a four in the house. I got a four in the house. Facebook, YouTube, you guys are on, okay? All right, the correct answer is indeed number three, no urine output, no urine output. So when, when a person is in shock, okay, when a person is in shock, the kidneys try to conserve as much fluid as possible in order to stabilize, ah, blood circulation. So little to no urine output is observed, okay? All options are expected symptoms in dehydration, but not necessarily hypovolemic shock. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. So when a person is losing a lot of blood, then the kidneys say no more fluid is leaving this body. That means no urine, no sweat, no nothing. Okay. Um, and so that's what happens. Now, that was question number four. I do have a fifth question, but are you guys up for the challenge? Last uh, last time, Facebook helped us. So YouTube, it's on you. The bonus question today, let me show you how it works. Right now, we have 60 YouTube likes. If we can get 100 YouTube likes on this video, it will unlock the next question. So YouTube, it's on you. Facebook held us down last time. So YouTube, we just need like 40 more likes on the video. There's over 200 of y'all watching. So we're going to see if YouTube can do it. Here is a testimonial video. Future nurses, my name is Simi B and I just passed the NCLEX. Um, I used everything that I possibly could before I used Remar's program. Nothing helped, nothing worked. I was constantly doing like practice questions and I wasn't getting the scores that I wanted to get. Someone in my nursing orientation program, um, I did an externship. They told me that I should try Remar and I did. And I passed the NCLEX after the third try. Um, I was very discouraged. I was very sad and depressed after taking it last year. I lost my grandmother. I went through breakups. I went through a lot last year. I couldn't get my mind focused, but I practiced with Remar, used her, used the full six weeks, um, even a little bit past the six weeks. I love the Quick Facts books. I love the Remar books. I'm a visual learner, so everything, just being able to have that one-on-one -on -one with her was amazing. And I just want to tell anybody who feels discouraged and has gone through loss and breakups and everything, you can, you will, and you must pass NCLEX. Thank you. I love that. Yo, you guys did it. Shout out to YouTube. Y'all held us down. Somebody said unlock the volume. <laughs> Oh, Lord. But we did. Uh, congratulations, Nurse Simi B. You did it. I love it. I love it. Visual learner. 
right here, Inklex Virtual Trainer for all of my all types of learners. Um, but yeah, you did it. YouTube held us down. Facebook is on you next time. It's on you. Here's our next question. I want to tell you guys do. This is question number five. Who among the list of clients is at most risk of hypovolemic shock? Is it number one, an elderly client experiencing difficulty breathing? Two, a pregnant client reporting vomiting with frequent urination? Three, a motorist with facial abrasion? Four, a university instructor with a ruptured aneurysm. Let's say if you guys, ooh, ooh, I thought this would be, I thought we would be on one accord. I got some different answers here. I love it. I got some different answers here. Oh, ooh, mm. I'm glad we did this one today, guys. It's coming down between two and four. Those are good ones. It's coming down between two and four. But remember, we're saying who is most at risk. Shout out, Jennifer. I love that. Um, who is most at risk for hypovolemic shock? Now that you have committed to your answer, here is the correct answer. It is number four. Yes, 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 yes. The university instructor with a ruptured aneurysm. And let me tell you why. Because remember, with aneurysms, you are going to have um, a very large, massive amount of internal bleeding. And a ruptured aneurysm, most of the time, it can be deadly for a patient, all right? Because the hemorrhaging that results is difficult to treat. I mean, you have to you have to go in there surgically and clean it up. The patient, oh my goodness. And don't let it be an abdominal aorta that bursts. My goodness. So um, it is more likely for this patient to have a hypovolemic issue than a pregnant person who is vomiting, right? Um, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. So remember aneurysms. If you need to go back and look at it, Make sure you do that, uh, but that is a serious, serious issue, okay? Five out of five today for some of you. That's amazing. I'm so happy about that. Remember, you have to be a, a generalist. That is our term for today, nurses. That means you have to know a little bit about a lot for your NCLEX exam. There's no safe place. There is no safe place. Um, and so um, I'm glad we were able to come together as a community to do the NCLEX part. Now, I definitely have your Monday motivation. We are raising hopes, okay? We are raising hope today. And so let me ask you this question. This is serious. This is a serious question. Then you could just say yes or no. Do you ever feel like you are not improving in your life? Like you're stuck in the same place? You're not achieving and, and getting what you want. Um, and so like when you get in that situation in a certain place, you gradually lose the, the hope or the desire that something is going to change, right? When, when you feel like you are just going, spinning wheels, doing the same thing every day, you're in a rut, you're not achieving what you want, you see everybody else you know, live in their life, seemingly to be moving forward. And you were like, I'm still doing the same thing. I'm still living in the same place. I'm still like doing what I've been doing. Like I'm in this funky comfort zone that I just can't get out of. And so what happens is when you get to that place, you know, um, what happens is sometimes you begin to lose hope because we are looking at the wrong thing. We have our, our hope, our eyes set on the wrong thing. So I, I wanted to remind you guys that it's okay to be in that situation, but you still have to be focused on the right thing. So when, when we have hope, right? When we have hope, it is us being able to see that there is a light, there is a change coming despite all of the darkness around us. And so one of the things that can get us through difficult times, that can get us through challenging times, is the hope 
that something better is coming. And so, you know, where do we get our hope from? Y'all already know where I'm going with this, okay? Y'all already know. I keeps it real plain and simple where our hope comes from, where the possibility for us to get out of any difficult, challenging situation. And I know some of you that watch me are living testimonies of but God. Some of you are living testimonies of but God can get you through a difficult or challenging situation. I have talked to you. I have hugged you. I know where you are. I know exactly what it is to have to push through, right? And so let me say that, let me, I'm, and you know, I wasn't even planning to show you guys this, but let me show you this. So today I got this thing put on me. Do you guys know what this is? Does anybody know, has anybody ever seen this before, right? I'm showing you guys this. This is how I'm, I'm being really transparent because I didn't plan to do that. Um, but God is always, always bringing us to a place that we can exercise our faith. He always gives us opportunities to see his hand at work. OK, um, and so what I'm wearing right now and I didn't even know it's new. It's a halter monitor and it monitors my heart. Right. Uh, so, you know, your girl, she puts out a lot of energy. I, I put out a lot of energy. I've had, um, you know, I've had covid. Right. And so after covid, I had some reoccurring complications with my heart. And this is something that some people report after they have COVID, they have these symptoms in the long COVID game that you have issues with. So I got a halter monitor put on me and I'm thinking, God, I don't have time for this. I got to get ready. I got to keep going. But in everything, we have to stand on, not on our own strength, right? Not on our own strength, but on the strength of the Lord. Right. And so even if, you know, things are not as we plan or they are not as intended, um, we have to remain faithful to the promises. Right. Um, and in our own weakness, we draw strength from our creator. Yes, 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 yes. And so no matter what, with God is possible. You know what I mean? And so I'm challenging you guys today that we are to give our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations to God, right? Um, for those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagle. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint, okay? That is our scripture. Amen, 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 amen. Yes, we will We will soar like wings of eagles. I just, I just love that, okay? Doing the work, but not growing weary in that, not fainting in that. And um, I just want to be mindful of that for myself today. And that's the journey that I'm on right now, right now in this moment, I'm on that journey. And I know that um, I wanted to invite you into this thing, right? And so, our promises is this, that God will not let you down. And if you put your hope in him, his plans for you will be fulfilled, right? And when God gives you something, there is joy and there is peace to it. Um, there is joy and there is peace to it. And so it is God who is able to bring hope into your life, even when things seem hopeless, right? Even when things seem like there's no way or what is going on or why, why is this failing me? Why is this not serving me? Why is this happening to me, God? Why, why am I experiencing loss in this area? We have to understand that in everything that you go through, in that moment, you will be provided the strength to get through it. And, and maybe you don't have the strength today, right? Right but you will when you need it. And so we have to have a hope that God is always sustaining us. He's always holding everything together, always holding everything together. And um, 
It is the, the prayers that we give for each other, right? It's us encouraging each other. It's us sharing. You know, I don't want y'all to look at me and think uh, everything is perfect with me all the time. And I, I don't go through trials and tribulations and struggles. That is a daily thing with me. Every day I'm asking God, God, drag me through this day, okay? By the hem of your garment, get me through this day. All I can worry about is this day. I cannot be worried about tomorrow. I don't have it in me. And so for us, this Monday, we are setting our eyes on just the challenges of today. We are just asking, what are we, what are we supposed to be asking for every day? Our daily bread, not tomorrow's bread, not the weekend's bread, but our daily bread. Lord, just get me through this day, right? Lead me not in temptation this day, right? And so um, we have to have our hope, our hope in him. All right, guys. Yes, just this day. <laughs> oh, man. You guys are great. You know, coming here every week, starting our week off right in the right mindset um, helps us to um, anticipate wonderfulness on the back end. And so, yes, God has a work for me to do. So I can't get caught up in the in the things that I see. I have to be focused on the unseen where it's really all happening. Right. Because we get we get caught up in, in just the things that we see. We limit what God can really do in our lives. So I'm saying to you guys, if nobody told you this, guess what? Guess what? You can. You will. And you must. Passing 